On April 9, 2009, 42-year-old Abraham Shakespeare drove his fancy black BMW 750i car towards an upscaled gated community in Lakeland, Florida. Abraham stopped his car, hit a remote control on his sun visor, and waited for the large gate that kept his neighborhood separated from the rest of the city to open. Then Abraham drove through the gate and glanced in his rearview mirror. His friend, Dee Dee Moore, was following right behind him in her black Hummer. Abraham led Dee Dee through the neighborhood's winding roads that were dotted with large two-story homes with huge front yards and swimming pools in back. Then he pulled into the driveway of his own house that looked a lot like the others in the neighborhood. Abraham parked his car and stepped outside. He was six foot four inches tall with long skinny arms and legs. He had a beard and a black spandex cap that covered his dreadlocks. He wore a white t-shirt and jeans. Dee Dee's huge Hummer pulled into the driveway behind the BMW. Dee Dee got out and smiled at Abraham. She was 36 years old, and she was tall with dyed blonde hair, and she laughed and talked a lot. Dee Dee went around to the passenger side of the Hummer, opened the door, and took out a video camera and a tripod to put the camera on. She closed the door and then followed Abraham into his house. And Abraham led her through his living room that had high ceilings, large leather couches, and a state-of-the-art TV. The furniture, and most of the decorations inside, had come with the house when Abraham bought it. Abraham asked Dee Dee how her day at work had been as they walked up the staircase to the second floor. And Dee Dee told him that things were going really well. She owned and operated a successful medical staffing agency, and she said business just kept getting better. Then they walked down a hallway on the second floor into a room that Abraham used as an office and as a place to relax and watch TV. And when they walked into the room, Dee Dee set up the tripod, put the camera on it, and turned the camera on. Then she asked Abraham if he was ready for her to film him. Abraham looked at the camera. He grinned and said, yep, he was ready. Since Dee Dee's medical staffing agency had taken off, she had spent a lot of time and energy following her dream of becoming a writer. She wanted to write books and movies. And when Dee Dee and Abraham had met through a mutual friend about six months earlier, she was fascinated by his life story. And she thought he would be the perfect subject for a biography or a documentary or maybe even a Hollywood blockbuster movie. Dee Dee pressed record on the camera and asked Abraham just to talk about himself a little bit and to tell her about his life. Dee Dee thought getting Abraham to tell his story in his own words would be a great resource for her for when she started writing a book or movie about him. So Abraham started talking into the camera and pacing a little back and forth, and as he talked about his life, it seemed like he was almost reliving certain moments from when he was younger. And that made Dee Dee smile. And as she listened, she thought even his last name, Shakespeare, was perfect for a storyteller like Abraham. Abraham had grown up poor, and he had dropped out of school when he was about 12 years old to go work in the citrus fields that thrived in that part of Florida. And Abraham had left school without really learning how to read or write beyond the most basic level. And as he got older, he started to understand that his employment options would always be limited. And so he had spent the majority of his life moving from one odd job to another, trying to make ends meet. In the room upstairs in his house, Abraham stopped pacing for a second, and he thought back to some of the low-paying jobs he'd had. And he said going from job to job and struggling to survive had made it clear to him just how much the city of Lakeland was divided. Lakeland was part of the Tampa Bay area, and in Lakeland, some of the wealthiest people in Florida lived just miles away from some of the poorest people. And Abraham said when he was younger, he would pass by the gated communities where the rich people lived, and he would tell himself that someday he would figure out a way to move behind those gates. But it was a dream that most people in his poor neighborhood laughed at, and for most of Abraham's life, that dream he had seemed like it was impossible to achieve. But even though Abraham had spent decades living in his mom's house and working low-paying jobs, he had refused to let that bring him down. And everybody who knew Abraham said he was one of the kindest, most positive people they had ever met. Then, three years earlier, on November 15th of 2006, Abraham had been working as a delivery man for a food distribution company. Abraham's co-worker, Michael Ford, had been driving the delivery truck that day, and he pulled into a convenience store to get cigarettes and a drink. But before Michael got out of the truck, Abraham had reached into his pocket and taken out $2. Abraham was pretty broke at the time, and he knew he shouldn't just throw money away, But he stared at the dollar bills in his hand and then gave them to Michael and asked him to buy two quick-pick lottery tickets. 
and Michael laughed, grabbed the money, and went inside. A few minutes later, Michael had gotten back in the truck and given Abraham the two lottery tickets. Then, the following evening, Abraham had been sitting on the couch at his mother's house, watching the winning lottery numbers get announced on the local news. And he had just stared at the TV, stunned, because each winning lottery number that just got announced matched a number on a lottery ticket he was holding. At first, as the numbers kept matching over and over again, Abraham had kind of laughed it off and thought, you know, this is not going to happen. But when they were about to announce the final number, he could feel his heart beating faster, because all he needed was one more match. He leaned in close to the TV and watched as the newscaster called out the final winning lottery number. And when Abraham had heard that number, he checked his ticket, then he checked it again and again, And then Abraham jumped off the couch and started shouting to his mother that he had just won the lottery. Abraham's mom came into the room and she thought he was playing a prank. But when he showed her the numbers on the TV and the matching numbers on his ticket, she started screaming and crying because Abraham had hit the $30 million jackpot. Fast forward back to the present and Abraham smiled into the camera and Dee Dee smiled too. Just hearing Abraham tell that story about winning the lottery was like listening to somebody describe a miracle, like something that never really actually happens in real life. But then Abraham stared down at the floor, and a look of total exhaustion came across his face. So Didi asked him if he was okay, and Abraham told Didi about what had happened almost immediately after he was shown on the TV collecting his big lottery winnings. Even after a huge amount of taxes and a reduced payout for taking his lottery money immediately instead of over several years, Abraham walked away with about $12 million, more money than he'd ever imagined having in his whole life. And with that money, Abraham had bought his dream house in one of Lakeland's beautiful gated communities for the rich, and he had gotten himself a very fancy car, that BMW. But soon after that, a lot of people had seemed to take advantage of Abraham's kindness. And he was lending money to friends, family, and people he had never met before. And he was paying for their mortgages, healthcare bills, college tuition fees, startup expenses for businesses, and just about anything else people could think of. And Abraham said that he loved helping people. He really did. But over time, it had just gotten more out of control. And now, two and a half years after he had won the lottery... He said there were days where he would get hundreds of text messages from people asking for money, and he just felt like he couldn't say no to any of them. In fact, Abraham had a cousin named Cedric Edom who owed him thousands of dollars in mortgage payments on a house that Abraham had bought and let Cedric live in. And now Abraham could barely even get Cedric to talk to him, let alone get Cedric to pay back any of the money he owed. And Abraham hated that he felt like his lottery money was coming between him and his friends and family. From behind the camera, Dee Dee asked Abraham if he was tired, and he turned away from the lens, then glanced back and said he'd been tired for a whole year. And he said sometimes he dreamed of running away to a beach in some other country and just disappearing forever. Not long after that, Dee Dee stopped recording. She could tell Abraham was getting upset, and she felt for him. She hadn't won millions of dollars, but she said when her business had taken off, she had her share of people coming out of the woodwork asking her for money. And she knew that even for someone who was as good of a person as Abraham, that pressure could take its toll. And so Abraham and Dee Dee had talked for a little while longer, but not for the camera. And then at some point, Abraham looked around the room and then stared out the window at his sprawling yard. Abraham lived in a place he'd once dreamed about. And now all he wanted to do was get as far away from that house as possible. And after this day, April 9th, 2009, when Abraham and Dee Dee chatted and Abraham spoke for the camera, Abraham just kind of disappeared. And in the days and weeks following this day, Dee Dee, Abraham's mom, and some of his other close friends and family did get occasional text messages from Abraham, but nobody saw him or talked to him on the phone. And in the text messages he sent, Abraham always said that he was doing fine and he just wanted to be left alone, but he never said where he actually was. And so Abraham's apparent decision to just leave without telling anyone really upset his mom. They had always been really close, and she had talked to Abraham almost every day for his entire life. So now only getting a few text messages from him every now and again, with kind of sparse information about what he was doing and where he was, was very difficult for her to deal with. 
But like Dee Dee, Abraham's mom had seen up close how people constantly came to Abraham for money and how that really weighed on him. And she knew Abraham had started to imagine himself walking on a beach where nobody knew who he was and where nobody would bother him. And so Abraham's mom and his other family and friends didn't try to find him. They just kind of respected that he really just wanted space. But then fast forward to November 9th, 2009, seven months after Abraham was last seen by anybody close to him. And on that day, Detective Dave Clark of the Polk County Sheriff's Department was sitting at his desk looking at a report that didn't make sense to him. The Sheriff's Department had gotten a call from Cedric Edom, Abraham's cousin who owed him thousands of dollars. And Cedric had said that his cousin had been missing since April and he wanted to file an official missing persons report. Detective Clark, who had short blonde hair and a goatee, looked really young, but in reality, he had been in law enforcement for years and he had experience with almost every kind of case. And Clark had a reputation for being one of the best listeners and one of the most objective officers in the entire department. In fact, during interrogations, Clark was known to give suspects every chance to tell their side of a story because he genuinely believed in the assumption that people were innocent until proven guilty. But as much as Clark had seen over the years, and as much as he tried to give people the benefit of the doubt, something about this missing persons report felt really strange to him. If this man was missing, why had his friends and family waited seven months to tell the police? Clark leaned back in his chair and read over the report again. And this time, when he read the missing person's name, his eyes went wide. He grabbed a piece of paper and pen and started writing down some notes. Because Clark remembered something that he hadn't thought of in years. Clark knew who Abraham Shakespeare was, because after Abraham had hit the lottery jackpot back in 2006, news stations in the area covered what they called Abraham's rags to riches story over and over for weeks. So Clark now knew he was dealing with a potentially missing person who was worth millions and millions of dollars. And when that much money was involved, there was always the possibility of foul play. And so Clark wanted to get to work on this case right away and he wanted to start his investigation with the man who had filed the missing persons report, because Clark was interested in finding out why, after all this time, Cedric had now decided to come forward and track down his cousin. A few hours later, Detective Clark led Abraham's cousin, Cedric, into an interrogation room at the Sheriff's Department, and Cedric was combative almost from the moment he walked in. He told Clark he didn't understand why he was being questioned, and he said he was the only one who seemed concerned at all about Abraham. But Clark just smiled and asked Cedric to sit down with him at a small table in the cramped, bright room. And then Clark said that they had contacted Cedric and asked him to come in because he was the one who had contacted them. And the police really just wanted to know what was going on with Abraham that had concerned Cedric enough to get in touch with authorities. Cedric took a breath and tried to calm down, but it didn't work. And in a very angry voice, he launched into an attack against a bunch of Abraham's friends, including Dee Dee Moore. And he said they were all really greedy people who took advantage of Abraham. And then Cedric said he was almost positive that one of them had killed Abraham and taken off with his money. Clark listened and let Cedric talk for as long as he wanted. And Clark thought it was a little weird how quickly Cedric had jumped to the conclusion that Abraham had been murdered. But Clark didn't mention that. And when Cedric finally stopped talking, Clark smiled and talked to Cedric almost like they'd been friends for years. Clark said he'd done some research right after getting the missing persons report, and so he knew that Cedric owed Abraham thousands of dollars in mortgage payments on a house that Abraham had bought for him. Cedric shook his head and the anger in his voice came right back and he said he loved his cousin and he reiterated that he was the only one doing anything to find him. By the end of the interview, Clark was even more surprised than he had been by the missing persons report. He didn't have enough evidence to hold Cedric, but he thought if something really had happened to Abraham, Cedric had to be at the top of the suspect list. Here was a guy who hadn't said anything for seven months who owed Abraham thousands of dollars talked about a potential murder, and then immediately tried to put the blame on other people. So Clark couldn't shake the feeling that Cedric might have contacted police in an attempt to cover his own tracks in some way. 
But Clark was going to remain objective like he always did, and even if he was potentially connected to Abraham's disappearance, there was also a chance that he was telling the truth. And so maybe there really were friends of Abraham who were out to get his money in any way possible. So later that day, the sheriff's department subpoenaed the cell phone company in order to get a detailed account of Abraham's cell phone records. But Clark knew that could take a while, so he dug further into some of Abraham's financial records, and the list of people who owed him money was astonishing. In the three years since Abraham won the lottery, he had loaned millions of dollars to people. And this was just in the form of property expenses, medical bills, educational costs, and other loans that had a clear paper trail. But Clark figured Abraham must have also been handing out money to people in his everyday life that he had not kept records of. So, tracking down all the people who owed Abraham money would take time and resources. Clark was willing to do whatever it took, but he still had no evidence, other than Cedric's word, that Abraham was actually missing. Clark needed to get a better idea of what was happening. So, he decided to talk directly to one of the people that Cedric had been eager to blame for Abraham's disappearance, Dee Dee Moore. On November 10th, the day after the missing persons report had been filed, Detective Clark found himself back in the interrogation room. This time, he was seated across the table from Dee Dee Moore, Abraham's friend who wanted to write a book and make a movie about his life. Dee Dee had on jeans, a t-shirt, and leather sandals, and Clark thought she was almost the exact opposite of Cedric when it came to interviewing her. She smiled a bunch and seemed very easygoing, and she said she would tell him anything she could, but that she didn't really understand why she was there. So, Clark asked her, you know, when was the last time you spoke to Abraham? And she said she had gotten a text from him somewhat recently and that he messaged her from time to time just to see how things were going in her life and to tell her that he was okay and enjoying his time away. Then, Clark took a breath and got a serious look on his face. He looked right at Dee Dee and told her that Abraham's cousin, Cedric, had said he was worried Abraham might be dead. Dee Dee immediately looked confused and said she didn't understand because as far as she knew, she was texting somewhat regularly with Abraham. And as far as she knew, Abraham had done exactly what he said he was going to do. Take off to maybe a beach somewhere and never look back. So Clark asked her why Cedric would have filed the missing persons report in the first place and why he might have pointed the finger at her as someone who might have wanted to hurt Abraham. Dee Dee just shook her head, and then she looked at Clark and said she had an idea why Cedric might come after her. Clark smiled, and in his friendly voice, he asked Dee Dee to fill him in. And Dee Dee said that she and Abraham's mom were two of the only people in his life who had pushed Abraham to follow up with everyone who owed him money and make them pay him back. They said it was one thing to be a kind person, but it was another to get taken advantage of. And they told Abraham that just because someone was family, it didn't mean they were entitled to get anything they wanted from him. Clark nodded and asked if that had caused problems in Abraham's life, having people like Cedric around. And Dee Dee's voice got a little louder and rougher, and she said Cedric preyed on good-hearted people. And she knew that as much as Abraham wanted to see the best in others, Cedric would never pay him back a dime. Detective Clark and Dee Dee spoke for a little while longer, and then Clark thanked her for her time, and after she left, he went back to his desk to look at his notes from both of the interviews he'd conducted over the past couple of days. And as he did that, all he could think about was how badly he wanted to see Abraham's cell phone records. Because Clark still didn't know if Abraham was dead in a ditch somewhere, like Cedric wanted him to believe, or if Abraham was just sipping pina coladas on a beach without a care in the world. In the days following his interview with Dee Dee, Clark kept digging into Abraham's financial records, and he and other members of the investigative team met with Abraham's friends, family, and as many people who owed him money as possible. But Clark also discovered something new that caught his interest. Michael Ford, Abraham's co-worker who had used Abraham's money to buy the winning lottery tickets, had filed a lawsuit about a year after Abraham had won the lottery. In that lawsuit, Michael had argued that because he was the one who actually bought the tickets for Abraham, he was entitled to at least a cut of the winnings. But Michael had lost his case in court, and Clark wanted to know if maybe Michael held a grudge against Abraham. So Clark pursued this new potential lead. But he discovered that Michael and Abraham had pretty much lost touch once the trial started, 
And Abraham had even stated publicly that he didn't blame Michael for doing what he did. And he said he would have been willing to give Michael hundreds of thousands of dollars if Michael had just asked him instead of going directly to the courts. Now, none of this ruled out Michael as a suspect in Clark's mind, but there was no evidence putting Michael anywhere near Abraham in the days and weeks before Abraham had apparently disappeared. So Clark knew he needed to keep looking elsewhere. And Clark still felt like he was in the middle of one of the most bizarre cases he'd ever dealt with, because no evidence had surfaced that suggested anything violent or against the law had even happened to Abraham. There was no body, there was no signs of distress at his house, and friends and family kept getting text messages from him. So Clark kept reminding himself that Abraham was a guy with the financial means to truly just disappear if he wanted to. But then, at the end of the month, something happened that would turn Detective Clark's attention back to one suspect in particular. On a day in late November, Abraham's mom contacted Detective Clark and said she had something to show him. So Clark drove out to her house, and Abraham's mom met him at the door and invited him inside. The house was warm and comfortable, and being there, Clark felt even more of an urge to discover where Abraham was, just so he could put Abraham's mom's mind at ease. Clark thanked Abraham's mom for calling him and for welcoming him into her house. Then she led him into the living room and picked up an envelope from the coffee table. She opened it and showed Clark a greeting card with a Christian cross on the front. And she said when she'd gotten this card, there had been a $100 bill inside of it. She handed the card to Clark and he opened it and he saw a scribbled note that said, I'll be home soon and Abraham's signature underneath. And Abraham's mom said that even though her son had trouble writing, he had always made sure he could sign his name. And she recognized that was definitely his signature on the card. Abraham's mom told Clark that she had gotten the letter about two months earlier, but she had forgotten about it. She said she was sorry she had not shown it to him sooner. Clark said that was totally fine and that he was grateful that she was showing it to him now. And he picked up the envelope that the card had come in and he squinted his eyes, almost like he was trying to look for something that wasn't there. Because there was no stamp or address on the envelope and it didn't look like it had been mailed from anywhere. So Clark asked Abraham's mom how she'd actually gotten the letter. And she told him her nephew, Abraham's cousin, Cedric, had hand-delivered it. Just hearing that made Clark feel like his investigation had gone right back to where it started. Then, without Clark saying anything, Abraham's mom said that even though Cedric was her nephew, she didn't always trust him. And she didn't necessarily believe he was just trying to do right by Abraham by filing the missing persons report. And then she looked Clark in the eyes and told him all she really wanted was to hear from her son. If she could just hear his voice, she would know he was okay and everything would be fine. Clark said he understood, and he thanked Abraham's mom for all her help and told her he would keep her informed if he learned anything new. Then, Clark went back to the station, and he told other members of the investigative team that he wanted to keep looking into Abraham's cousin, Cedric, because giving Abraham's mom a card with a hundred bucks and Abraham's signature in it seemed like one more way Cedric could be trying to cover something up. And then, Clark got some information that he was confident would break the case wide open. The phone company had come back and they provided police with a detailed history of text messages sent from Abraham's number. And something in those text messages stood out to Clark right away. And by December, Clark believed he was closer than ever to finding Abraham. On December 26th, 2009, so a month and a half after the missing persons report was filed, Abraham's mother was relaxing on the couch at her house. Christmas had been a mixed blessing that year. She loved seeing friends and family for the holidays, but not having Abraham around just hadn't felt right. They had always spent Christmas together, and so the house kind of felt empty without him. But then her phone rang. She leaned over, grabbed it off the coffee table, and almost started crying tears of joy because Abraham was calling. The connection wasn't great, but she could hear her son on the other line, and that was all that mattered. Abraham wished her a Merry Christmas and said he was sorry he hadn't called the day before. And Abraham's mom said that was okay and that she just wanted to know how he was doing. And he said other than dealing with a little winter cold, he'd been great. And he knew him leaving had been very hard on people, especially her, but he felt like he'd made the right choice. And he promised he'd be home soon and when he did, he'd be much happier than when he left. Abraham's mom hung up the phone and she felt better than she had in months. And she wanted to call everyone she knew to let them know the good news. She had finally heard from Abraham. She had heard his voice. But first, she thought she needed to tell the police. 
So she took a deep breath, collected herself, and called the sheriff's department. On December 26th, right after Abraham's mom had gotten this call from her son, Detective Clark was sitting at his desk. His phone rang, and he picked it up, and he could hear Abraham's mom almost shouting at him on the other line. She told him about the phone call she'd just received from Abraham and how happy she was, and so Clark thanked her for letting him know, he wished her a Merry Christmas, and then hung up. But then, he immediately made a call to the cell phone company so he could get a location on where Abraham's phone had been when he placed this call to his mother. And when Clark heard what they had to say, he shouted across the room to a fellow detective and told him they needed to leave immediately. Clark and this other detective ran out of the station. They climbed into an unmarked car. Clark sat in the passenger seat and the other detective drove. And before long, they were peeling out of the parking lot and heading onto the street. It was a mild winter day in Florida, about 60 degrees Fahrenheit, but the sun was bright and Clark could feel himself sweating a little from the adrenaline rush. Minutes later, they pulled off the road and into a parking lot of a huge shopping mall. And when they arrived, Clark and the other detective saw the man they were looking for sitting in a parked car nearby. But before the detectives could get out of their car, the man they were looking for drove off. And so Clark looked over at the other detective and just said, chase him. So the detective peeled out of the mall parking lot and raced down the street after this man in the car. But the detectives realized they didn't have police sirens in their unmarked vehicle, so they couldn't signal to the driver that they were cops and they wanted to pull him over. So the detective just tried to stay as close to the man they were chasing as possible. Then finally they came to a red light and the man they were after stopped. And so without even thinking, Detective Clark threw open his door, he ran in front of this car, he held up his badge, and he yelled at the driver to get out and come with them. The man in this car just stared up at Clark, and then he slumped his shoulders and put his head down. And later that day, after they had all talked back at the sheriff's station, Detective Clark knew where Abraham Shakespeare had been all this time. Based on interviews and cell phone data collected throughout the missing persons investigation, here is a reconstruction of what police believe happened on April 9th, 2009, when Abraham first disappeared. On that night, Abraham drove his car down a road in an upscale neighborhood in a town about 20 minutes away from his house in Lakeland. Abraham had spent much of the day talking to Dee Dee on camera, and he was still thinking about getting away from Florida and kind of dropping off the map for a while. But before he did anything drastic, he wanted to make sure he had enough cash on hand to just disappear. And he hoped to avoid leaving a paper trail as much as possible so it would be harder for people to track him down. So Abraham was on his way to the house of someone who owed him money and who had told Abraham that they had thousands of dollars in cash that they could give him. While Abraham wound his way through the neighborhood, the person he was going to see sat inside their house and waited for Abraham to arrive. And a few minutes later, they saw the headlights from Abraham's BMW outside. So they went to the front door, stood in the doorway, and waved to Abraham as he stepped out of his car. When Abraham got to the door, the person he was meeting with could tell that Abraham seemed down. But they said hopefully getting some cash would cheer him up. Abraham smiled and walked inside and followed this person through their living room and into a small home office. Abraham stood in the middle of the office and the person he was meeting with walked across the room to a floor safe standing in the corner. Then that person crouched down, they entered the combination for the lock and opened the safe. And then they just waited there for a second. Abraham asked if everything was okay and this person said, yep, everything's fine. I just need to make sure I grab the right amount of money. Then this person reached into the safe, slowly stood up, turned around, and aimed a gun right at Abraham. A look of fear came across Abraham's face, but before he could turn to run, the person shot him right in the chest, and blood began to stain his white t-shirt. Then the person fired again, and this bullet grazed Abraham's heart and perforated his lung. The shooter casually walked across the room and stood over Abraham, and they watched and listened as Abraham slowly died. Then the killer put the gun back in the safe. Then they went back to Abraham's body, crouched down, took his phone out of his pocket, and slipped it into their own pocket. Then they grabbed Abraham's legs and dragged him out of the room. 
Abraham was skinny, but he was very tall, so dragging him through the house was not easy. But eventually, they managed to pull Abraham to the back door, and then they dragged him out into the backyard. A fence surrounded the yard, and it was totally dark out there except for some moonlight. So the killer did not feel like anyone could see them, so they didn't rush. They bent over, caught their breath, and then picked up a shovel that was laying in the grass. Then they started digging a hole in the middle of the yard. Finally, when the hole was deep enough, they walked over to Abraham's body, grabbed him by the legs, dragged him across the yard, and dumped him into the hole. Then they took the shovel and filled the hole back in. Later that night, they cleaned the bloodstains from inside their house and out in the yard, and then they found a phone number of a construction company that they planned to call the next day to place a concrete slab over the hole where they had just buried Abraham. Then the killer went into the living room, hooked up their video camera to the television, and watched the recording they had made with Abraham earlier that day. D.D. Moore, Abraham's friend who was an aspiring writer, had murdered Abraham. It turned out that months before the murder, she had convinced Abraham to give her control of his finances, and she had promised to play the bad guy and collect money from all of Abraham's friends and family who owed him. And she even agreed to hold on to a large amount of Abraham's cash for him in her safe so he wouldn't be tempted to just hand it out to people who asked him for money. And because Dee Dee was a successful business owner, Abraham had believed she would be better at managing money and collecting debts than he could ever be. So he thanked Dee Dee for her help and put her in charge of millions of dollars in cash and assets. And Dee Dee had collected money from people who owed Abraham, but instead of giving the money to Abraham, she kept it for herself. And she spent that money and some of the cash Abraham had given her on a brand new huge Hummer vehicle and other expensive items she wanted. And for months, Dee Dee had gotten away with it without anyone suspecting anything. But then, in the spring of 2009, not long before the murder, one of Abraham's friends started to catch on to what Dee Dee was doing. Because even though he was making regular payments to Dee Dee to clear his debts with Abraham, she kept asking him for more money. And when he got angry and said he had already paid what he owed, Dee Dee worried he would tell Abraham, and Abraham would find out that she had been stealing his money. So, Dee Dee decided she would just get rid of Abraham, but keep collecting the money people owed him for herself. But in order to do that, she had to make it seem like Abraham was alive and just wanted his distance. And so, when she filmed him on her camera, claiming it was for her book and movie, even though in reality she had no aspirations to write Abraham's story, she intentionally steered the conversation to how tired and frustrated he must be, and when Abraham talked about wanting to escape to a foreign beach, Dee Dee knew it was time to put her plan into motion. So she told Abraham to come to her house to get thousands of dollars in cash that she'd been holding for him in her safe, and when he arrived, she killed him and then used his phone to text his friends and family, and then she showed some of his friends and family the video recording of Abraham where he was talking about how he wanted to leave Florida and go to a beach somewhere and just kind of disappear and be left alone. And so naturally, his friends and family believed that that was what happened to Abraham. He had chosen to kind of go away. And Dee Dee almost got away with it. But once Abraham was dead, Dee Dee became relentless in her pursuit of his cousin Cedric. And she called Cedric and came to his house all the time, demanding he pay back all of the money he owed Abraham. And Cedric just wasn't going to do that. And so finally, Cedric got fed up with Dee Dee and he filed a missing persons report. Now, Cedric did not actually believe that Abraham was dead, but by alleging that he had been murdered and pointing at Dee Dee as potentially the murderer, he knew that would launch a police investigation into Dee Dee and that would get her off of his back for at least a while. And when Detective Clark got a record of Abraham's text messages, he was shocked at how well written and how formal they were. After all, he knew that Abraham still struggled with reading and writing. Then, when Abraham supposedly called his mother on the day after Christmas, Detective Clark got confirmation that what he believed had been going on was going on. Somebody in town had been using Abraham's phone and had been pretending to be him. And when Clark traced Abraham's phone to the mall parking lot, he and the other detective saw Dee Dee leaning into a car, handing over cash to a man, and taking a phone back from him. And when they chased that man down, 
He admitted that he was a friend of Abraham's who Didi had paid to call Abraham's mom and pretend to be Abraham. And the man had told Abraham's mom on this call that he was fighting a winter cold to make up for the fact that he didn't really sound like Abraham. Not long after that, Abraham's cousin Cedric came back to the sheriff's station and he admitted that someone had paid him to deliver the greeting card that Abraham supposedly wrote to his mother. And it would turn out that the money Cedric was paid to make that delivery could be traced back to Didi. And so Cedric had been right about Didi all along without actually knowing it. With all of this new information and with Abraham's phone records, police determined that every text message that had been sent from Abraham's phone since he disappeared had actually been sent by Didi. And eventually, they learned that Didi had hired a construction company to lay a concrete slab down in her backyard. So, on January 27, 2010, over nine months after Abraham's murder, police went to Didi's house, and they broke up the concrete slab out back, dug up the ground underneath, and found the skeletal remains of Abraham Shakespeare. And pieces of the t-shirt and jeans that Abraham had been wearing in the video that Dee Dee recorded on the day she killed him were still clinging to his bones. Dee Dee was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison without parole. Abraham was given a proper burial and his family was finally able to grieve. And his murder helped lead to a new Florida law that keeps the identities of large jackpot lottery winners private for 90 days. And in a telephone interview from prison, Dee Dee surprised reporters and said she strongly supported this new law. In the spring of 2017, Antonio Navarrete was on top of the world. Just a year earlier, the 21-year-old Florida resident had met the love of his life a young woman named Daisy Martinez. And now, Daisy was pregnant, and so she and Antonio were very excited about starting a family together. For the time being, Antonio and Daisy were living with Antonio's parents in his hometown of Waimama, which is a quiet rural suburb just south of Tampa. But Antonio had a bright future ahead of him. Ever since he had graduated high school, he knew what he wanted to do with his life. He wanted to be an auto mechanic, and he had the skills to do it. From the time he was a toddler, he had always been obsessed with cars, breaking apart his toy cars and putting them back together. And then as he got a little bit older, he began drawing these very intricate drawings of cars that he loved or designs for new cars. And then when he was a teenager, he began actually tinkering around with real cars until he finally acquired a car of his own. It was a white Chevy low rider pickup truck that he tricked out with all these fancy lights and special rims and this huge sound system that took up most of his back seat. It was thanks in part to this truck, which he nicknamed Casper, that Antonio, who was too shy to be much of a ladies man, met up with Daisy in the first place. Antonio had driven Casper to a local car meetup for other car enthusiasts where you could basically park your vehicle and you could walk around and see what other people did to upgrade or enhance their vehicles. And so while Antonio was there, he was walking around when he saw on the far side of this meetup, there was this unbelievably beautiful young woman and he found himself just staring at her. He couldn't help it. And this young woman, who was Daisy, she eventually would look up and she would smile at him, and the rest, as they say, was history. Six months later, not long after Daisy had moved in with Antonio at his parents' house, and the couple had announced to their delighted families that they were going to have a baby, Antonio got yet another good piece of news. He'd landed a good job with a company that did maintenance work for Tampa Electric Company's Big Bend Power Plant, which was located in Apollo, Florida, which was about 10 miles to the east of Antonio's parents' home. Now, this was not Antonio's dream job. He still very much wanted to eventually become an auto mechanic, but this job paid 12 bucks an hour, nearly double what he was used to making. And so with this job, he and Daisy would finally be able to raise enough money to get a place of their own, hopefully before the baby arrived that fall. Also, Antonio had been told by other people who worked at this company that this was actually a really easy job, that pretty much you just rolled around on golf carts all day picking up trash. It was perfect. A few weeks later, on June 24th, Antonio found himself driving in his truck to the Big Bend power plant for his first day on the job. As he drove, he would have glanced over at the picture of Daisy he had taped to his dashboard. She was the only woman he had ever loved besides his mother. 
When Antonio arrived at the Big Bend power plant, he was totally amazed at just how enormous this thing was. It was basically this huge factory that sat right up against the water, and there were four huge smokestacks coming out of the ceiling of this factory with white smoke billowing out of them. This plant produced electricity, and they did this by burning coal. This process was done in four distinct units that were inside of this factory that Antonio was looking at. And each of these units is comprised of a humongous boiler, which is basically a 12-story tall oven. And so coal is loaded into this huge boiler, and it burns at the bottom of the boiler, creating some steam. And that steam goes up the boiler and begins to turn these huge turbines, creating the electricity. And then the steam just continues up the boiler and then out its respective smokestack into the air. In newer units, the airborne ash, which is a natural byproduct of burning coal, is captured inside of the boiler. But at Big Bend, three of their four units were built in the 1970s, so they were older models, and they did not capture the airborne ash inside the boilers. Instead, the ash would get heated up so much that it would melt and turn into a substance called slag, which basically is molten lava, like the stuff that comes out of volcanoes. That's what slag is. And so as the slag kind of builds up inside of the boiler, it would go through this man-sized hole at the very bottom of the boiler, and right below that hole is this 30-foot-tall water tank called a cooling tank, and this red-hot slag, it basically dumps down into that water, which cools it off, turning it into these kind of glassy rocks. And then they settle at the bottom of this 30-foot cooling tank, and at the bottom of the cooling tank is this grinding mechanism that pulls these hardened, cooled-off little boulders of slag into it, and it crushes them up and spits them out on the other side as little tiny bits of slag chips. And then these chips get sold for use in everything from sandpaper to roofing shingles. So after Antonio had spent several minutes just admiring this gargantuan building he would be working in, he gathered up his things, he hopped out of his truck, and he headed toward the front doors. That day, and the next couple of days, were very uneventful for Antonio. He basically just sat in a break room and watched videos about safety and training. And then when he wasn't doing that, he was out trying to navigate around the inside of this huge factory, which was basically this huge maze. And he found very quickly that it was a very hazardous place to work. As there were huge trucks moving around inside of it, it was super loud. And there was just heavy machinery operating constantly all around you. But after several days of just kind of walking around and asking people what things were, Antonio felt like he had a pretty good handle on the layout and also on what his job would entail. On Thursday, June 29th, so just four days into doing this new job, Antonio woke up in his parents' house in a really good mood because the next day, that Friday, Daisy was going in for an ultrasound and they were going to find out whether their baby was a boy or a girl. And he was very excited about this. And so Antonio came downstairs, he grabbed a quick bite to eat, and then he kissed Daisy on the cheek, and he headed outside into his truck and began the commute to work. A few hours later, Antonio's mother was in the grocery store when she pulled her phone out of her purse, and she noticed Antonio had called her and she missed it, but he had left a voicemail. And so she played the voicemail and then put the phone to her ear. And what she heard was quite possibly the most traumatic thing a mother could ever hear from their child. After leaving the house that morning, Antonio drove all the way to work, no problem, he parked in the lot, he went inside the building, and initially the day was like any other day. He just kind of drove around the facility and picked up trash, and that was it. But just a couple of hours into his shift, two fairly significant issues arose simultaneously inside of Unit 2. In the boiler, the slag that was building up had somehow created a sort of plug over that man-sized hole where the slag was supposed to dump into the water chamber. And so as more and more slag was being created as the ash melted, it wasn't draining into that chamber, and so all of this slag was just building up on top of itself inside of the boiler. And then in the water chamber, completely unconnected from the issue in the boiler, the slag that had fallen into the water chamber that had cooled and settled at the bottom, it had landed in such a way that it actually blocked the grinding mechanism. And so none of the cooled slag boulders and rocks were being ground up and expelled out the other side. And so they needed to fix these two issues quickly, otherwise Unit 2 would become basically ineffective. 
Now, the safe way to fix these two blockages would be to start by turning off Unit 2's boiler. And then once it was off, you could drop dynamite into the boiler itself and break up the blockage over the man-sized hole, and you could send a team into the water chamber after you drained it to chip away and move the blockage over the grinding mechanism. However, turning a boiler off at a power plant is extremely expensive, and so the Tampa Electric Company decided, you know what, let's just have them fix these blockages without turning the boiler off. And so at four in the afternoon, a senior plant manager rounded up five other employees, which included Antonio, to come with him and do these repairs inside of Unit 2. And so the plan was to empty all the water from the cooling chamber of Unit 2, and then once it was empty, they would open something called the doghouse door, which is on the outside of the cooling chamber towards the bottom. They would open that up, giving them a line of sight into the bottom of this cooling chamber where that grinding mechanism was, where all those slag rocks had kind of come to a stop on top of it, and they would fire water cannons into the bottom of this cooling chamber to attempt to dislodge these slag rocks off of the grinding mechanism. And then after they cleared that blockage, they would shut the doghouse door and they would somehow deal with the blockage inside of the boiler. But that felt like a secondary issue. They needed to make sure the grinding mechanism was cleared before they did anything else. Now, you need to understand that this company had asked their employees to do this type of repair before, to do it with the boiler still on. And in the past, nothing bad had ever happened. And so these six guys, including Antonio, must have thought this was just totally routine, that we would never be asked to do something like this if it was extremely hazardous. But it would turn out what they were doing, making these repairs with the boiler still on, was quite possibly the most hazardous thing they could possibly do at this plant. But either way, the six-man team made their way over to Unit 2, and they began taking up positions with their water cannons right in front of the doghouse door. Antonio's job for this operation was actually not to be involved in getting the slag free. He was just going to be there to clean up during and after the operation. And so he stood kind of in front of the doghouse door, but maybe 10 or 15 feet back, just kind of standing back, watching the other guys do their jobs. Now, you need to understand the scale of the machinery in front of Antonio and these other men. You have the water chamber, which is 30 feet tall, and then above the water chamber is the 12-story tall boiler that is still on. So there's coal actively burning inside of it. There's red-hot slag, so like lava, just kind of tumbling around inside of it. And the steam inside of this boiler is well over 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And so they are dwarfed by this totally dangerous piece of machinery. But eventually, their operation begins. The senior plant manager has the water chamber drained, and then after it's empty, they open the doghouse door, and Antonio watched as the other five men took turns with their water cannons, firing them through the store at the big slag rocks that are sitting on top of the grinding mechanism. And it wasn't really working that well, but they were starting to make some progress. And Antonio likely was just kind of getting bored waiting for this to be over because there really wasn't much for him to do. There wasn't much cleanup. And then as he's standing there, something horrible happened. Because the boiler had been left on, all that ash was still getting melted and turned into slag. And the slag was not being drained because that plug had formed over the man-sized hole in the boiler. And so you have all the slag that's building up, building up. It's getting heavier and heavier and heavier. And about 20 minutes into their cleanup operation, the weight of all that slag broke through that plug, immediately creating an opening where all this red hot slag, this lava came tumbling down. It rebounded on the back end of the empty water tank and shot out of the doghouse door like a tidal wave of hellfire. And in seconds, thousands of gallons of this lava-like substance was all over all six men. It was like a wave going over. Over them, And then after the slag hits the ground, they were all standing in six inches of basically lava that stretched in 40 feet in any direction. Now, unlike trying to run in, let's say, mud or deep water where you're just kind of moving slowly, every step you take in this slag 
basically your foot melts into the slag. So with every step, your shoe melts, then your skin melts, then your bones melt into this substance. And so all these men, after immediately being hit with this stuff and catching on fire, literally, they likely tried to start running, but it was like their bodies were slowly consumed by this slag feet first. And so Antonio tried to run like the rest of them, but he couldn't go anywhere and he fell onto the slag. So he's laying on his side and as he's melting and burning to death, he reaches into his pants pocket with his free hand and he pulls his phone out and he calls his mother. She doesn't pick up and so he leaves her a voicemail and all he says is, Mom, Mom, I'm burning. Please call the cops. Please, Mom. And in the background of this voicemail, all you hear is the hissing sound of the steam and slag pouring out of the boiler. In total, five of the six men that were a part of this repair operation would be killed from this tidal wave of slag. Antonio would be one of them. Tampa Electric would end up paying out a settlement to each of the families of the deceased. The next and final story of today's episode is called The Ninth Compartment. On the morning of August 12, 2000, 33 of Russia's best naval warships stopped inside of a particular section of the Barents Sea. The Barents Sea is this 800-mile stretch of freezing water up in the Arctic Circle, just northwest of Russia, and these 33 ships were in this stretch of water for this huge military training exercise. Basically, they were going to run through some war game scenarios, where, for example, one ship would pretend to be an enemy combatant, and the other ships would work on locking onto that ship and firing at them. But of course, they wouldn't use real missiles or torpedoes, they would use duds that didn't actually explode. And so around 9 a.m., the man who was in charge of this entire operation, his name was Admiral Popov, and he was actually on board one of these 33 ships, he authorized one of the submarines that was out there to shoot two of their dummy torpedoes at a target, an enemy combatant, which was actually just one of the other ships. And so as soon as he did this, he was authorizing the start of this multi-day long exercise. And so all day and all night, they're doing these war game scenarios. And by the following morning, so 24 hours into this exercise, Admiral Popov stepped away from the action to speak with Russian reporters on the phone. And during this interview, he tells them that so far, the training exercise is going exactly to plan and that it looks like it will ultimately be a huge success. However, there was a problem. At the same time, Admiral Popov is giving his remarks to the reporters about how well this exercise is going. The family members of some of the crews that were out there as part of this exercise, they heard a rumor that the exercise was not going to plan, that in fact, something bad had happened to one of the ships. But none of the family members had any more information beyond that. Even though this rumor was just that, a rumor, the family members of these crews that are participating in this exercise, they naturally became very worried. And so they all, that morning, began calling the naval base where the 33 ships had originated, asking for more information. And the phone operator on the base that was receiving all of these calls that morning at first was telling these family members that, no, nothing's going on, I haven't heard anything, there's no issues. But eventually, this phone operator let slip that, in fact, they too had heard the rumor that something bad had happened, and they think it actually might be true. But when this family member who heard this pressured the phone operator for more information, the operator clammed up and said, you know, I can't give you anything else. And so at that point, the family member hung up the phone and called the media and told them what was going on. And the media, as soon as they had the story, they went right to Admiral Popov and they said, hey, can you address this rumor? And he didn't. He did not respond to any of the media's inquiries. And in a weird way, that was kind of reassuring to the family members of these crews because they're thinking, you know, if Admiral Popov is just kind of ignoring this rumor and he's staying out there out on the Barents Sea still conducting this exercise, then certainly nothing bad could have happened, right? And so for the rest of that day, Sunday, the family members of these crews and the media just kind of did nothing because there wasn't anything else to do besides wait to see if there was any new news coming out of this exercise. And the following day on Monday the 14th, so 48 hours after the start of this training exercise, there would be news 
Russian officials would go on TV and they would address the rumor by saying, "Well, yeah, it is true. Something did happen out during this exercise. The Kursk, which was the name of one of the submarines that was one of the 33 ships that was part of this exercise, they experienced some minor technical difficulties that forced them to ground their vessel at the bottom of the Barents Sea. But don't worry, this is normal. We're in touch with them through the radio. Everybody is fine. We are pumping air and power into their submarine, and before long, we will have them back on the surface. There is nothing to worry about. Now, naturally, the family members of the Kursk crew, specifically, they panicked when they heard this because even though the government is acting totally confident that everything is fine. They did not feel confident that everything was fine. Their family members are trapped on the bottom of the ocean, but at the same time, they remembered the Kursk, the actual submarine, was a very special and very safe submarine. The Kursk was quite literally Russia's best ship. They had spared no expense on it. It was extremely expensive, and it was massive. It was bigger than two football fields put together. And it was constructed out of this very specialized, highly reinforced steel that allowed it to take a direct hit from a torpedo and just keep on going, no problem. It was also outfitted on the inside with all the latest and greatest technology. And so, if you were going to be stuck at the bottom of the ocean inside of a submarine, you would want to be stuck inside of the Kursk. And so, the families took solace in that. But over the next couple of days, despite the government reassuring everybody in the news that everything was fine, it's totally minor. We're going to have the Kursk up in no time. Despite all that, the Kursk still had not been raised to the surface, and the government was not giving the families or the media any new information. And so, in this kind of void of no real information, the families began to panic, and the media began to speculate. Did the Kursk really suffer from minor technical difficulties, like the government was saying, or was this something more serious? This question would be answered on August 21st, so nine days after this training exercise had begun, when a Norwegian dive team they were out there to assist in the recovery effort. They were able to dive down to the Kursk, and they actually got inside of the submarine through an escape hatch. An escape hatch is like this watertight closet that kind of sits on the outside of the submarine, and it allows people to go in and out of the submarine without flooding it. And once these Norwegian divers got inside of the Kursk and had a look around, they were totally shocked at what they saw. While the exact details of what happened inside the Kursk are still debated today, and probably will be for some time. There is one aspect of the story that is more or less universally accepted, and that is what happened inside of compartment number nine. The Kursk was divided into nine watertight segments called compartments. Number one was at the front of the submarine, and then it went two, three, four, all the way down to nine in the very back of the submarine. And the reason we know what happened inside of compartment number nine is because a 27-year-old Kursk crew member, Dmitry Kolesnikov, told us. Dmitry was born into a family of submariners. His father was a submariner, and his father's father was a submariner. And Dmitry idolized them, and so growing up, that was all he ever wanted to be. And in the late 1990s, his dream would become a reality when he commissioned as a naval officer in the Russian Navy and was given orders to serve on board the Kursk. Four months before this training exercise out in the Barents Sea, Dmitry met and very quickly married a high school teacher named Olga. And right after their wedding, one of the first things he did is he brought her on board the Kursk for a tour. And Olga brought along a video camera and filmed her tour through the ship. And on this video, Dmitry is all smiles. He is so happy to be leading her around the ship and introducing her to people and showing her all the cramped spaces on board the submarine. It's really obvious that Dmitry was so proud of his job. Not only of his job, but also just so proud to be sharing this part of his life with his wife. Fast forward to August 12th, 2000, and Dmitry, along with 117 other crew members on board the Kursk, had just arrived at their designated section in the Barents Sea for this training exercise. And at 11:27 a.m., the captain of the Kursk came over the radio and he told Admiral Popov, who was not on the Kursk, he was on a separate ship. He told the admiral that the Kursk was about to fire their two dummy torpedoes. After this call was made, the men in the first compartment of the Kursk, so at the very front of the Kursk, this is where all the torpedoes, both fake and real, are stored. They began loading these two dummy torpedoes. 
Meanwhile, Dimitri was all the way back in the seventh compartment, the engine room. That was where he was stationed. He was actually in charge of everybody who worked in the seventh compartment. And so as these two dummy torpedoes are being loaded, Dimitri and his men, there weren't that many of them, they were twisting dials and pulling levers, when all of a the sudden there's this really loud crashing sound, and then the ship shudders and then jolts hard to one side, as if someone had grabbed the front of the submarine and just forced it to one direction. What Dimitri and the men in the seventh compartment could not have possibly known was that one of the real torpedoes in the first compartment had malfunctioned and it exploded. But because of how well built the Kursk was, how strong the exterior walls were, this torpedo, as advertised, did not puncture through it. It did a lot of damage and caused a massive fire, but the sub was not sinking. So back in the seventh compartment, Dimitri, he stands up from being jostled to the ground and the alarms are going off and everything is totally chaotic. Everyone's asking what's going on. And Dimitri, he takes charge and he tells his men to follow the emergency protocol which was to seal the watertight doors of your compartment. And so in this case, he sealed both the doors, one leading to the sixth compartment and the other leading to the eighth compartment. There's a lot of reasons for why they do this, but in essence, if there's a leak somewhere in the submarine, by sealing off your compartment, you protect yourself from being flooded. As Dimitri and his men are sealing these two doors, they would have begun to see and smell smoke as it came in through the ventilation ducts because there was now this uncontrolled fire raging at the front of the submarine. They also would have felt the submarine suddenly pitch upward at a very steep angle as the captain of the Kursk desperately tried to surface. But before they could reach the surface, that uncontained fire reached the other live torpedoes and it set off this almost instantaneous chain reaction of explosions. This second collective blast killed virtually everyone in the front half of the submarine. Either the blast itself blew them apart, or once this hole in the front of the submarine, because the second blast did puncture the walls, once that hole was created, all this arctic water began flooding into the submarine. So if you didn't get killed by the blast, you very quickly drowned. The only people who survived the first and second explosions were anyone in the sixth compartment going backwards, so six, seven, eight, and nine. And so Dimitri and the other men in the seventh compartment they would have been definitely badly shaken up from that second explosion. That completely rocked the submarine and sent them tumbling all over the place, but they would have been very alive and very aware of the terrible situation they were in. And so I would imagine that Dimitri and the others tried to grab onto any of the piping or anything they could as the submarine, because the control tower has been destroyed, just angled straight down and began careening downward. At 11.32 a.m., just four minutes after that initial explosion, the Kursk slammed nose first into the ocean floor 350 feet below the surface, and then the back half of the Kursk came down to rest. We don't know exactly what happened on board the Kursk for those first two hours after they hit the ocean floor. What we do know is they had power, so there was light inside of the submarine. Also, the air purifiers were still working, so despite the chemicals and smoke that was in the air, it was relatively easy to breathe. During those first two hours, we also know that at some point, Dimitri and the other men in his compartment must have heard banging coming from the sixth compartment, because remember, they had sealed off the doors both to the eighth and the sixth compartment, and so Dimitri decided to break emergency protocol, and he opened the door to the sixth compartment to allow any of the survivors that were banging on the door to come into their compartment. And when Dimitri and his men opened that door and looked into the sixth compartment, they would have seen that it was rapidly flooding and most likely anybody forward of that compartment, so 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, they were already dead. By 1.30 p.m., Dimitri and his men in the seventh compartment and the other survivors from the sixth compartment, they were forced to retreat from the seventh over to the eighth compartment and then finally into the ninth compartment because of flooding. Even though they had sealed off their watertight doors, the walls were no longer watertight because this huge explosion had sent shrapnel flying down the body of the submarine, puncturing holes in all of the walls. And so it didn't matter if you shut your watertight door, eventually as one compartment would fill up, it would begin leaking through all the cracks in the walls. 
And so Dimitri and all of the people he was with, they would have been very aware of that. And so by the time they got all the way back to the ninth compartment, the very back compartment, there was nowhere else to go. The water was going to eventually reach them and they were doomed unless they got rescued or if they left out of the escape hatch. Despite how absolutely terrifying this situation must have been, Dimitri remained calm. In fact, he was so calm that he pulled out a piece of paper as he's sitting in this cramped ninth compartment with these 22 other men, and he writes the date and time in the corner, and then he begins to kind of describe what had happened. He talks about there being an explosion, and he thought he and these 22 men were the only survivors, and he says they're now trapped in the ninth compartment, and they have to wait for rescue. He also talks about how they had considered going out the escape hatch, but apparently it hadn't worked. After Dimitri wrote this very neat, very legible, very organized note, he folded it up and put it in his pocket, and then for the next hour and a half, he sat inside of the ninth compartment with the 22 others, and the power went out, which thrust them into absolute pitch darkness. I mean, completely black inside of there, and the temperatures, because the power was out, suddenly began to plummet, and then the worst part was, the water began seeping through the walls. And so Dimitri and the other men, they would have known that it's just a matter of time before this room fills completely with water and there is nowhere to go. And so with the water rising all around them, Dimitri pulls that paper back out of his pocket and he adds to the note. And this time his handwriting is barely legible. And it's because he's probably suffering from hypothermia, so he's shaking. He can't see what he's writing. In fact, he writes the words, I'm writing blind, to indicate it's totally dark in the room. And in this second note, he leaves on this piece of paper, which was dated and timestamped an hour and a half after the first one, Dimitri indicates that he does not think he's going to survive. It's very clear none of them think they're going to survive. Then, with the remaining space on this piece of paper, Dimitri writes this very loving and very thoughtful message to his wife and his family saying goodbye, and then his final words on this note are, regards to everybody, no need to despair, Kolesnikov. After he wrote this second message on this note, he folded the paper up, put it in his breast pocket, and then in total darkness, listening to the sound of water rushing into the room, he and the other 22 damned souls prepared to die. We don't know how long Dimitri and the other 22 men survived in compartment 9, but experts say the entire Kursk submarine was completely flooded 8 hours after the initial explosion. One of the most heartbreaking aspects of this case is that Dimitri and these 22 other men could have potentially been saved if the Russian response was a little bit more urgent and coordinated. Despite two of the ships, including the ship that Admiral Popov was on, hearing and feeling the second explosion that the Kursk experienced, nothing was done about it. It was reported, but no one really did anything. And then when no one could get in touch with the Kursk after they had said they were going to fire those two dummy torpedoes, everybody else, all the other ships, Admiral Popov, they all just said, you know what, I'm sure it's just their radios and they're fine and they'll be in touch soon. And so it wasn't until later that evening when the Russian Navy even figured out there was a major problem with the Kursk, that the Kursk has vanished. And then it would be several hours before they even got a rescue submersible in the water down to the Kursk. And then once it was down there, they could not latch onto the escape hatch on the submarine. And so even if there were survivors inside of the submarine, they would not have been able to exit into this rescue submersible. And so for days and days, the Russians struggled to try to get inside of the submarine and kept turning down foreign aid from Norway, from America, from Great Britain. And then finally, nine days after the Kursk had sank, the Russians did accept foreign aid. And that's when the Norwegian dive team, they went down and they were able to open up the escape hatch. And when they went inside the submarine, they saw it was completely flooded. There were bodies floating everywhere. And that's when ultimately Dimitri's body was found and they found that note tucked in his breast pocket. Russia would go on to award the entire crew of the Kursk with the Order of Courage, which is a very significant military award. And the families of the crew of the Kursk were given 10 years salary each. They were also given free housing in any Russian city and their children would all have their college education paid for. 
Thank you for listening to the Mr. Ballin podcast with exclusive episode. If you enjoyed today's stories and you're looking for more bone chilling content, be sure to check out all of our studio's podcasts, Mr. Ballin Medical Mysteries Bedtime Stories. Just search for Ballin Studios wherever you get your podcasts and you'll find them all. Also, there are hundreds more stories like the ones you heard today, but in video format on our YouTube channel, which is just called Mr. Ballin. I really appreciate your support until next time. See you.